Number one, Ibble Dibble here. Hello, friends, and welcome to another very special episode of Ibble Dibble, wherein I dissect Harry and Meghan. I'm still talking about episode two. It'll take me a long time to get through these. <laughs> I prefer the thoughtful approach to the summary approach. I hope you're on board. Today, I want to talk about where Meghan and Harry's narcissism intersects with their classism and what it means to be maliciously colorblind. In short, Harry believes being a prince means he's above criticism or even being inconvenienced by the inquiring public that has bankrolled his family for a thousand years. He thinks we should trust not only that he has good intentions, but that he is intrinsically right. And he believes that anyone he chose as a wife is entitled to the same deference. As for Megan, she learned how to play thick and sweet from her mother she had no idea what racism was. It's a total coincidence she only dated rich, well-connected white men. A total coincidence that the only female friends of hers who aren't white themselves have done the same. When it comes to silencing their critics, Megan and Harry are warriors against racism. When it comes to providing any tangible benefits or support to true victims of racism, they're colorblind. So far in episode two, Megan has taken us on a trip down memory lane, showing us the expensive neighborhoods she grew up in, the expensive schools she attended, the expensive lifestyle she maintained as a well-paid actress and social media influencer, and the expensive jewelry she wears today. All of this presumably to make us believe that she is something closer to who we would expect a prince to marry, but also to give some credence to her claim that she was completely unaffected by racism until the UK press was rude about her mother. Needless to say, her conflation of race and class is intellectually lazy, socially ignorant and really rather offensive. She illustrates this conflation for us first with the headlines she claims are racist. Let's take a look. Number one, no mention of race or color in the accompanying article. This is classism. Number two, the only mention of race in the accompanying article is, quote, with ancestors freed from slavery, the American sweetheart's upbringing could form the perfect rags to riches story, which actually sounds like a positive, and I have to give it to the Daily Star. They were the only tabloid to do a numbers comparison. In the past week, Crenshaw has been plagued by 47 crimes, while Highgrove, Harry's own hood, has dealt with just 21 incidents in the past year. What would you say? Classist or racist? Headline three is just a blurb from the same article as headline two. This is my favorite. Headline four is just facts. The Daily Mail commissioned a genealogist to look back in her family, and they did so. This is a story about her family's history. It's actually extremely well-researched, extremely interesting, and totally respectful. And when I look for mentions of race in the original article, we have, quote, Meghan Markle, who is said to be dating Prince Harry, has spoken of her pride in her family's mixed race roots. Her mother's family is from Tennessee and Georgia and includes both black and white ancestors. Records allude to the racially divided nature of American history, with her great-great-grandfather recorded in a census as mulatto. Markle, 35, appears certain to have slave ancestors with her great-great-great-grandparents born in the South before the Civil War. The crude racial language reflects the obsession of the Jim Crow South with delineating the races, end quote. It even quotes Megan herself, quote, in a frank interview with Elle, Megan talked about the struggles of growing up with a white mother and black father. She said, you create the identity you want for yourself, just as my ancestors did when they were given their freedom. Because in 1865, which is so shatteringly recent, when slavery was abolished in the United States, former slaves had to choose a name, a surname to be exact. Perhaps the closest thing to connecting me to my ever-complex family tree, my longing to know where I come from, and the commonality that links me to my bloodline, is the choice that my great-great-great-grandfather made to start anew. He chose the last name Wisdom. He drew his own box. End quote. <laughs> Thanis, the genealogist hired by the Daily Mail, couldn't find such a relative despite going back far enough. And you know what, Megan? That's fine. There's nothing wrong with being descended from tailors, teachers, and cleaners. This is a perfect example of the patented H&M column a racist method. <laughs> the Daily Mail exposed her as a liar, and in this documentary, she's calling them racist. 
Headline five is just another blurb from the same Daily Mail article in headline one. And headline six simply seems classist. What's wrong with having to use a laundromat? But I can't honestly tell you because the original nationalenquirer.com link forwards you to the homepage of intouchweekly.com. Guess they couldn't afford the lawsuit. Headline seven is an op-ed the Daily Mail printed, not a news piece. It does discuss race. It does it in a very tongue-in-cheek way, sort of <laughs> treating the royal family like pedigreed dogs or horses <laughs> that have become so inbred their health is suffering. Quote, so I have done my due diligence on Miss Markle, and this is where I stand. Genetically, she is blessed. If there is issue from her alleged union with Prince Harry, the Windsors will thicken their watery, thin blue blood and Spencer pale skin and ginger hair with some rich and exotic DNA. Miss Markle's mother is a dreadlocked African-American lady from the wrong side of the tracks who lives in L.A., and even the sourest spinster has to admit that the 35-year-old actress is extremely easy on the eye. End quote. Definitely classist. Racist? I don't know. It's sort of equally insulting to the two of them. Even more tenuous than H&M's conflating racism with classism is they're conflating racism with xenophobia. Immigration is very often in this country a cipher for race. So it was an inauspicious moment for Britain to be trying to live out this fairy tale story of this fairy tale princess and this diverse, modernizing country. Now, there is simply no doubt that racist crimes in the UK increased during this time. That said, racism was a small part of it, not the heart of it. The heart of it was the failure of the UK government to afford equal economic opportunities to native Britons. Members of the working class felt they were denied training and jobs in favor of cheap labor from abroad, left without stability, left without dignity. This was not a color issue. Most of this xenophobia focused on European immigrants from Poland, Romania, Italy, white people. In fact, mathematically, a Leave vote was less racist than a Remain vote because EU membership heavily favors European economic migrants. Only so many migrants are allowed in a year, so migrants from non-EU countries, who are far more likely to be non-white, were much more strictly limited in number when the UK was a member of the EU. Whether you believe leavers were smart enough and egalitarian enough to understand this and accept it or not, the idea that a 75% white, wealthy American marrying a prince would be personally impacted by this anti-immigrant sentiment is ludicrous. She never got an acting job in the UK, despite having a UK agent for some months. And <laughs> the role of princess is a role for one, not really subject to equal opportunity laws. I'm pretty sure people marrying into the royal family don't have to qualify per the shortage occupations list. And if the headlines and video snippets used thus far were disingenuous and deceptive, the sound bites they use to support this point straight up insult our intelligence. Everybody should, should feel concerned about illegal immigration. We don't know who these people are. How dare they show this man's face and insinuate he's a racist because he stated the obvious. Everyone in every country, regardless of their color, should be against illegal immigration. It's incredibly dangerous for everyone involved and entirely unrelated to the topic of Meghan and Harry. Because Meghan's ego is so huge that despite years of evidence to the contrary, she continues to believe that simply repeating stories to us about herself over and over again will convince us that she is right. It wasn't enough to pay these talking heads to berate the UK press she had to do it personally. Listen to this. This concert I went to there, I went to with my mom and we were in the parking lot leaving and my mom like honked her horn this woman was taking a long time to like figure out how to get out and the woman turned around and screamed the N-word at my mom. I just remember my mom, like I remember the grip that her hands had on the steering wheel and then like you could see the, her it was so tight where like the knuckles get all wife and she was just silent the rest of the drive home we never talked about it i would never in my life heard someone say the n-word Okay, so we're starting out with a narcissistic pity play intended to help us excuse her for her ignorance. 
very different to be a minority and not be treated as a minority right off the bat. It's less and less different as time marches on. <laughs> And it's certainly not new. Did you know that in colonial America, the Spanish freed fugitive slaves from the English colonies in return for their service to the Spanish king and conversion to the Catholic faith? In 1738, the Spanish governor of Florida established the first legally sanctioned free black town in the present day United States. It's called Mose. You can visit the archaeological site today. She repeats this claim in her NAACP. CP award scene too. People don't talk about what it's like to be mixed race. Yes, they do. And they have for a long time. If Megan, any of her employees, any of her trolls, any of her sugars, or really anyone curious about this is listening, I recommend the book Light, Bright, and Damn Near White, Black Leaders Created by the One Drop Rule, written by Michelle Gordon Jackson, forward by Adam Clayton Powell IV himself. Obviously now people are very aware of my race because they made it such an issue when I went to the UK. But before that, most people didn't treat me like a black woman. I can't tell you how many times I've rewatched this and how disturbing I find it. To her, the problem isn't racism writ large, personal or systemic. The problem is public awareness of her race. In other words, she didn't give a fluff about racism as long as she was passing for white, or at least felt more comfortable and accepted if it went unmentioned in the ever higher status, ever whiter circles she ran in. And she resents the UK press for more or less blowing her cover. The thing I find most off-putting is her use of air quotes around the words black woman. Most people didn't treat me like a black woman. Does she put black woman in quotes because she believes race is a construct and therefore there's actually no such thing as a black woman? Does she do it because she believes she is not in fact a black woman? Does she do it because she believes black women are not actually treated differently? What does it really mean to be treated like a black woman? Logically, the experience must vary greatly by region, locality, class, generation, educational level level and shade of black. If you're a black woman or a mixed black and white woman and have lived in both the US and the UK, like Megan, please sound off in the comments below. I want to hear real, honest, lived experiences. If you disagree or have your own thoughts or data points or papers or books to share, please let's chat in the comments. It seems like Megan also doesn't really know, but she says it like it's the worst thing in the world. Look at the micro expressions on her face as she says each sentence. I've never in my life heard someone say the N-word. A classic chin jut, smug, confrontational. Very different to be a minority. Closed, relaxed eyelids paired with a smile she's trying to hide. This is contempt. Not be treated as a minority right off the bat. Squinted eyes and pursed lips. She's angry. She's disapproving. She feels hard done by. There's something she'd like to say, but she's not saying it. Obviously now people are very aware of my race because they made it such an issue when I went to the UK. More eye blocking. We have closed eyelids paired with a real frown. You'll notice she's Botoxed, so her eyebrows aren't raising. This is total disbelief, total rejection. And the finale? Most people didn't treat me like a black woman. Like a black. How do you think Megan feels about being part Black? It's not giving happy and proud like she says she is, is it? She also distances herself from her Blackness in the NAACP scene. So much of my self-identification was trying to figure out where I fit in. And I think a lot of that is like, you're not white enough or you're not Black enough, but I don't see the world that way. Hold on. Not five minutes ago, you said you never grappled with being treated like a Black woman until you were in the UK. When did you do all of this racial identity wrestling? Do you really not see the world that way? Or do you just not want the world to see you that way? But don't worry, friends. Someone in that house takes real pride in being Black. Prince Harry. My son, my daughter, my children are mixed race. And I'm really proud of that. No, Harry, they're not. They're white. They will be afforded all the privileges of whiteness and then some. 
Perhaps, potentially, they'll have more empathy towards Black people due to the personal relationship with their grandmother. But your children are white. Racists treat you how they see you, not how you identify. Your daughter will never get called the N-word at the Hollywood Bowl like Doria. Also saying you're proud of your race is a very touchy subject. We don't choose it. It is what it is. You can be proud of heritage, certain family members, culture, beauty. Race? Uh, mostly, when people say they're proud to be this or that race, they mean that they refuse to be lessened, disparaged, denied, shamed, or guilted for their color, and that's an experience your children will never have. Are you really egotistical enough to think that simply by being an English prince and producing children with 5% African genes and very little appreciable African-American culture based on Doria and Megan, that you're somehow changing the world? But Harry and Meghan can help change the world, can help eliminate racism. They certainly have the connections and the resources. So that's why they set up the NAACP award, right? Haha, uh -huh, no. <laughs> Meghan and Harry did pay for their president's award in a sense. They agreed to fund a $100,000 a year grant called the NAACP Archwell Digital Civil Rights Award. What can you get the award for? being a long-term contributor to the digital rights space, working to expand equity, including issues related to discrimination, misinformation, privacy, countering biases, limiting profiling and surveillance, improving transparency, increasing diversity in the tech sector, and more. That all sounds fine. The question is, who decides the recipient of this grant? The NAACP? or Harry and Meg's. It looks like, at least this first year, Megan decided awarding Sophia Noble, the woman who wrote an entire book about Googling Black women are. <laughs> NAACP? <laughs> you have made a mistake. You just made a deal with the devil. <laughs> They're white devil jokes to be made here. Seriously, they're just going to use racism as a hammer to beat down their critics in the media. This is going to go sideways fast. Who do you think the 2023 grant recipient will be? Christopher Boozy? Okay, that's my rant of the day. I'll try to be more cheerful tomorrow. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Um.